I'm Simon Power from Cisco's Special Children's Group, supporting parents across the world who have kids with special needs. And today I'm really excited to be at Harlington Training Ground with Ian Holloway, the manager of Queen's Park Rangers. Ian has three special needs children and has long been an advocate for services and both medical and educational and today we want to learn some of his experiences. Ian Holloway, thank you very much for joining us today. And it is us as parents of children with special needs. And that starts at diagnosis. And in your case, you had the twins. So how was that for you and Kim? Yeah, it's, it's an awfully long time ago now, but um, a mother's instinct, she kept saying to me, there's something wrong, there's something not right. and. Um, one day I get home and my wife's crying and she said, I look at this. So she's got the baby Chloe then to, to mouth uh, mama, mama. And she just did it without any sound. Now we'd already had a little boy, so that's weird. That's not right. So anyway, we found out it. And, and when you know something's wrong and you don't know what it is and your mind races everywhere. I, I think that's the most frightening part. It was for us. When you are told and you know what it means, it's scary. But at least you have a chance to take on that foe, that enemy, whoever it is, whatever it is. You can, you can try and then deal with it, make the difference. So, um, and I think the worst thing was not knowing, not understanding what that loss of a sense means. What does it mean? What, you know, um, how do we understand a language that we don't know, which is sign language? How do we, how can we get through to these two 16 month old babies that have missed 16 months of information? So that was our, our scary moment, which when you're told you're, you're, they're both profoundly deaf, the shock of what that means how you then look at other people who are profoundly deaf and how difficult their lives are and, and everything about their lives. You, you, you have a choice then. You have a choice to feel sorry, to, sorry for your kids. Oh, and this is not fair and life's a, a chance to be a victim or the chance to actually say, well, come on, let's make the best this can be. Um, and at that time, we didn't know what that was. The experts didn't, couldn't explain to us the best way to do it because every deaf child responds in a different way to what little they have. So, so we, had, we had a couple of beautiful little girls who, if that's a jigsaw, then we didn't know what the picture was going to look like. So we didn't know how to start to put it together. So that's how we looked at it. But the more you learn, the more you go on, the more you're encouraged, the more faith and belief you get in meeting other people to help you understand that and and then more understanding you get of what a privilege it is to be this enlightened to really what's important you know and, and I feel I feel already that you and I both understand that because we both had different challenges to face for our children and and we, we know the most important thing, the only thing really, is to try and give them as good an education as we can. And every child in the world should have that privilege, you know, and unfortunately, um, you have to fight for that because it's the minority normally that misses out because of finances, because of, oh, that's, um, oh, you can't have that, that's not right, and you know, so, we, we had one hearing boy and um, his school came to us and said, oh, we think, he's, um, we think he might be dyslexic. So we're giving him an extra hour and a half of, of private tuition on his own just to, so it's only borderline. But, so we didn't even have to ask for it. Whereas our daughters with the hearing aids and the, everything that we needed, it was always a struggle. So, and the argument with how they should be educated, which was for me the biggest, biggest problem that I had and we just decided that what our daughters needed somebody should be able to provide exactly that it wasn't the fact that 
oh, sign language isn't right, we don't do that here, so they have to come to this here in school where basically they just get hearing aids given to them that they might not be able to use, and, but they'll have a mic and, be, and they have to, well, what if it doesn't work? We know they're visual, we know that works, so give us what they need. We have to move out the area to do that, you know, and, and for me, I fought so much that somebody else in that area that I left because I knew back in Bristol that was there going to be provided, that they thanked me for fighting for it, but really, it should be a given. So when you left Bristol to move up to London, you had lots of challenges with the girls and with their special school. Can you talk about how you manage both that work and life balance? Oh, that was, that was very difficult because the girls knew what they needed. They were sort of four or five-ish and, and deaf children go early to try and get them to catch up some of the knowledge. But in this, in the area we moved to, in the Berkshire area, they believed in um, the oral approach for deaf children. Every school in the area, um, it was oral based, whereas in Bristol, they gave them every language. And, and in, in, for deaf children, there's, there's three. BSL, British Sign Language. There's sign, sign Supported English. And there's English. So in that beautiful, wonderful little nursery that they had down there, they were comfortable because they understood the differences. So when they went to just the, the English, they couldn't cope with it. They were literally crying every day. So we had to put them in a taxi to get to the school, to cry every day, to come home, and they didn't want to go there. So we, I knew it was wrong. And that was just the way they did it in this area. So to balance that out, I was lucky I had an understanding manager because I actually went to Jerry Francis. He wanted me to move closer and he knew about my daughters and he knew about what we were trying to do and how we were trying to educate them. And he let me move back and drive um, 125 miles every trip. So it was 250 miles every day, which didn't do my back any good, but it was a small price to play to get my daughters the education that they deserved and they needed. They say football management is a stressful business and you've got stress on both sides of your life. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I, 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 I don't like people saying that I got stress. I don't deal with life as stress. Right? I don't think what I've been given is stress. I haven't ever been ill. My children aren't terminally ill. I, I, that's not stress. If I had that, that's stress. You know, for me, I've, I've been very, very fortunate liking football, being able to play football, being able to manage football, meet football people. So I'm very, very fortunate that I do what I love doing. So I don't call that stress. It's frustrating, like everybody, your life if it doesn't go well and, and you're, you're constantly hanging on a thread whether you've played well or not. It's the result, it's the score that matters. And, and we all know that it's not about the score really. You know, and, and it's about how you keep going through whatever life deals you. And, and for me, if you can show strength through a defeat and that helps someone else be strong when they need to be strong, then you're a winner anyway. So I don't like it that people think that being a football manager is stressful. I think it's an absolute privilege. So again, it's, it's about how you see it. Am I, do I get frustrated? Do I? Yeah, of course you do, because you want it to go well. But uh, there's always three outcomes in, in a football life. You've lost, you've drawn, or you've won. And really, they're all imposters, because it's how you perceive things anyway, and it's how, what you want to try and do to, to try and get more wins than defeats. And, and, and there's always a chance of that. So I always believe that we can turn this around because that's, that's the way I am anyway. And, and luckily I've got that from my own children who have shown me how easy life can be providing you're focused and you're ready to go to overcome God knows what that I haven't had to. I can hear, I can hear everything. I've got all my senses, they haven't got one. And it's massive, so how proud am I of them and how much have they taught me and how much of all the people who I've met who've helped me and my wife Kim 
educate our own daughters. So what can I say? How privileged am I to have witnessed them to have helped me in what I do? So some parents, especially at first, find it difficult to admit to colleagues or other people that they have children with special needs. Surely that's a wrong attitude. I, uh, I couldn't be more upset if I tried to hear that. For me, it's totally the opposite. I couldn't be prouder of my children. And I couldn't wait to show um, the world them and how brilliant they are and, and what, what they've got to do to get over whatever it is that they haven't been given. Not once have they moaned about it, not once have they not been very proud of having a deaf culture, you know? Um, every deaf person I've ever met is, is a privilege to have met them. I, I, I feel totally ashamed that anyone has to feel that they have to hide something that is, is um, something that their children have to cope with. It's not, it's not an ailment or an illness or something to be ashamed of. It's not a reflection on you as a parent. It's something that is disrupting their lives and you have to, you have to learn all you can about it and, and share it to, to give them the best opportunity as, in the world to get over it and, and make the most of it because I don't know any different and I, and I feel for those children whose parents feel that way. You're wrong, it's totally wrong. For me, it's a privilege to, to help as much as you possibly can, to give them as, the best chance they can have of having a tip-top life, however long it is, whatever it is, whatever that is, that's your duty to make them proud of themselves. Can I finish yes, on that? Please, you can. I think the worst thing of, for my children that I can glean was their lack of self-esteem. And it's hard enough anyway for all of us to, to deal with self-esteem issues. And for me, I know as a father and a, and a father of daughters in particular, that self-esteem is absolutely vital, that they believe in themselves, they like what they look like, they like who they are, they like, it's absolutely vital to any human being that that has to be propped up and supported, particularly by the parents. If you're lucky enough to have grandparents, particularly by them as well, normally they, that's a given, they do that anyway, but particularly the parents. So, you know, for me to hear what you've just said, it's probably the worst thing I've ever heard, but hopefully we can change that by just talking about it, by making it a point of, why are you ashamed? It's only a loss of something, whatever it is. Something isn't quite right, but that don't make you a bad parent. It makes you a bad parent if you're ashamed of that and you don't want to talk about it. For me, that child needs you more than ever, and you better get educated to give it the best chance it can to survive with the best possible life that you can give it. So I really don't understand. Hopefully, anybody who listens to this right now, the last thing I've ever been of my daughters is a shame. I couldn't be prouder. Ian Holloway, thank you so much. Thank you.